Welcome to Actium Talks, yet again another edition. Today, the 20th of May, 2022. A very good morning to everybody out there. Good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are tuning in from and catching us up on this show, Actium Talks, our weekly talk show every Friday, and we discuss um, the things that concern us in the realm of governance, especially electoral democracy. It's proudly brought to you by Alliance for Finance Monitoring, your political finance watchdog. And today with me, I have two distinguished guests that I'll be introducing in a short while. But before we start, as usual, I encourage everybody there who is um, on site, who wants to be getting these notifications, um, to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Akfim. We are also live on all our social media platforms, on Twitter, uh, at Akfim UG, uh, on Facebook, Akfim, and on our YouTube page, Akfim Uganda. You'll be able to catch us um, there and also be able to get the notifications and also be part of the conversations that we usually have around this time every Friday. My name is Felix, your usual moderator and, um, and host for today's um, show. And it's good to have two gentlemen again. We are guilty of the gender. Unfortunately, we couldn't uh, mobilize a lady. But we are well represented. Um, with me, I have um, two distinguished guests. Uh, one is an engineer, quite interesting. Another one is a youth. Um, if, uh, before I introduce them, Probably, I think, let me take this time to first lay a foundation on why we are here and help anybody out there who is um, tuning in and wondering what is it we are discussing about the Omoro by-elections and what are the scenes so far, so that uh, you can come on board and uh, be within context of the conversation. Now, for, for, for anybody out there who is just... Um, who has just arrived to this part of the country, or who is just following the news, um, Uganda is yet again engrossed in another by-election. And, and you remember um, um, uh, March, towards the end of March, we lost the speak of parliament. Um, and we continue to mourn and may you so rest in peace. Um, Honorable right, uh, Jacob Olanya, right Honorable Jacob Olanya, passed on on 20th um, of March, he was battling cancer. And uh, then he was, um, at the time of this demise, he was occupying this parliamentary seat for Omoro uh, County. And since then, the seat fell vacant. And uh, uh, he had been in that position for over a decade, I think since 2001 until 2022. And by the time he passed, when he was the Speaker of Parliament. So um, then, um, the seat fell vacant and we are in the process of filling that seat um, and uh, we now have uh, at least officially six candidates that are vying for that position uh, four of those candidates uh, flag bearers for political parties and two of them are running on independent tickets just run you through who is contesting um, we have andrew Ojok olanya who is the son to the deceased uh, the flag bearer for NRM. NRM is the, um, the National Resistance Movement. Um, it's the party, the incumbent party uh, in power. Um, another candidate is Mr. Simon Tolit Akecha, who is uh, standing on the National Unity Platform ticket. We also have Oscar Chiza of Alliance for National Transformation Ant. We also have Mr. Justin Odong Obia, who is standing on the ticket of FDC. FDC is Forum for Democratic Change. Then in the independents, we have uh, um, Walter Onen running as an independent. We also have Odonga Terrace also running as an independent. So officially, the campaigns um, kicked off this week. We are running until 24th of this month. Uh, so um, we have four days left to the end of the campaigns. We go to the polls on the 26th. Um, of May 2022. And as we speak now, I don't know, probably the panelists will be able to share with us. Um, we are expecting the president to be in Omoro to converse for the uh, NRM flag bearer. According to the timeline I have, it, uh, it should be 20th of, uh, which is today, Friday, of, um, should be in Omoro uh, conversing for the 
flag bearer of NRM. So we are now discussing what are the spinners, what are the spin-offs, what is happening, what's shaping up in the Omoro race. With me, I have engineer Olanya Oleng Tony. Uh, he is the chief executive officer of Nile Media Group. It's a Mac media company based in Guru City. And uh, he's also a seasoned politician and investigative political analyst. And uh, uh, he does, he is, he's also a strategic thinker on issues around political human interest stories that shape narrative and public debate. In the governance of Uganda, you are most welcome, engineer Olanya Oleng Tony. Uh, thank you so much, moderator. Uh, as I've been introduced, uh, I'm Engineer Olanya Lengetuni, and I'm happy to be part of this panel to, to especially discuss uh, the deeper angles of the Omoro by-elections that perhaps uh, certain areas are being left out. But of course, I hope to, to, to discuss and also bring on the table a number of issues and the underlining talking points, major talking points of the Omoro uh, by-election that are currently ongoing. And I'm, uh, I would say I'm glad and uh, happy to be part of this discussion. Thank you. The pleasure is ours. Thank you for being part of this discussion and joining ACFIM Talks. Our other uh, participant um, is uh, James Opito, who is, who is serving as the executive director at Gul NGO Forum. Um, and uh, is, uh, um, is a social and cultural anthropologist. Um, and a strong advocate for young people and uh, done a lot of work around civil society dialogues on national reconciliation and um, um, has a lot of interest around youth empowerment. And we shall see how that comes through, whether the youth um, are really, really, really participating in this process. Very good to have you, Jim, uh, James Opito. You must welcome to Actum Talks. Yes, uh, thank you, Felix and viewers. Uh, I'm very happy to join you today. And uh, I, I hope that when we enter into the gist of the matter, we will be able to discuss the, the intersecting issues regarding the moral by-election. Yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to be here on this platform. Thank you so much. You are welcome, and thank you so much for honoring our invitation. OK, um, um, let's get started. Um, you can catch us. We are live on our social media platforms. You can send in your questions, your clarifications, your contributions to the discussion. But let me get started. And I'm going to start with you, engineer Olanya Oleng Tony. Um, first of all, it's quite interesting to find an engineer who is equally political in nature. It's, it's, a, it's a unique mix. But uh, from where you are, your standpoint, give us a lowdown of what's happening so far uh, in this by election. We are in the heat of the campaigns. What is happening? What are the standout points so far? Uh, <clears throat> thank you once again. Uh, just like I clearly stated earlier on, Omoro, Omoro district is a, is a district that is in, in this uh, in the western part of Acholi, or West Acholi, as many people refer to call it. And uh, it has a, a very complex political dynamics that plays with it. Normally, the politics of Omoro is, is, is uh, dictated uh, or planned or perhaps arranged and uh, choreographed in Gulu. So the major talking points or the major players and the major planners of the Omoro by election are always people based in Gulu. They simply go to execute the roles uh, or perhaps the strategies they would have come up with. That is one other interesting point you may need to note that. Uh, the points where all the, the camps, the pitch where the pitching camps are always in Gulu. Um, one of the things that I clearly noted in the Omoro by election is uh, the use of money that has come in very handy. The use of money is quite strong. Uh, and uh, of course, the media, both mainstream and digital, make the platforms have reported cases of uh, bribery, cases of being bought off, uh, which of course I would. Uh, try to be specific and uh, not a few. Uh, of course, there are also offices in this government that have been, that have been, of course, uh, pinpointed on these allegations of uh, voter bread. Of course, there are still allegations, but of course, others are having glaring uh, public, because now these are things that you can't, the, the, the most interesting is situation with the political narratives here is uh, 
you bring it and leave it to the public court. I mean, it's it's the public court to deal with it. As the media, you can report about it and leave it as allegations. But uh, for now, because you would have other engagements to deal with, as, as each and every day goes by, there are new stories. So you may not have the entire capacity to 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 to, to investigate to logical conclusions. So some of them you investigate and leave it to the public court to deal with it. So. One of the things that uh, came out very clearly is the issue of the FDC candidate, the FDC flag bearer for that matter, because it wasn't yet a candidate. The FDC flag bearer, uh, Mr. Wani Dick, we learned from our sources that uh, the gentleman was nominated by the FDC to carry the flag. And then the day to nomination in the morning, we get information that the gentleman has been kidnapped. Uh, from sources within the FDC when we followed, we learned uh, uh, about this guy's kidnap. The gentleman was allegedly driven to Kamdini and uh, a, lot of under, a lot of other controversial statements kept on coming through. But of course, as media, what we found out was money exchange hands. Uh, some sources say uh, allegedly between 150 million to 300 million. Some highly placed sources talk about 700 million plus, of course, accruing to balances that were supposed to be paid. And of course, there was offices that were being implicated in these situations. Offices that were clearly being implicated was the office, is the office of the Speaker the, of Parliament, which is being implicated in these kind of scenarios of, uh, of, of trying to manipulate the FDC flag bearer, Mr. Wani Dixon. But also, most notably, uh, from our sources, we also learned uh, of uh, one name that came very strikingly in the Omoro by election, especially on the issue of the FDC candidate, the flag bearer for that matter. That is the name of uh, a priest who is based in Omoro, a Reverend Father. Uh, I don't, I, I, I will get the name right. Uh, the Reverend Father Willie, is, is Reverend Father Willie. His name came out very boldly on a number of uh, issues, especially because they say he was seen. He was the, the last person who was spotted with the FDC flag bearer the, the evening before. And we learned that the transactions for the money took place at the priest's home in, uh, in Omoro. So that is one other element that uh, was very strikingly and a matter that the members of the press clearly discussed severally. Uh, uh, of course, another talking point that would be of much interest is the angle of uh, much money being seen from the, from the surface and not being reflected in the economy of Omoro. I have interacted with uh, my team on ground, and I've been getting uh, updates from my team on ground. And among the things they say are that the locals are complaining that we see very many cars driving in Omoro, very many VIPs coming in through Omoro, but they don't see the financial or the economic benefits that clearly stands practically on ground. What do I mean? Basically, there is repatriation of cash. Cash comes in from other districts. Let's say Gulu, where the, the politics is being planned from, comes in, they only see the cars going back, meaning there's money coming in and there's money going back as it comes. Okay, those are things that the, the locals would, uh, of course, in this election, you would expect at least the major political players to inject, to my understanding, not less than 50 billion in this tomorrow by election. Okay, NRM alone as a party, I don't think they've spent less than uh, 5 billion in this so far. Because each and every day, you you, you, you you not expect the party to spend less than 50 million, at least from, because you're running a series of rallies in a very short span, which, are, of course, the Electoral Commission gave them only nine days for, for official campaigns. So the issue of money that the locals are not feeling, I mean, the locals would expect that money would come. Money is, they say money is coming, but money is going back. I mean, you don't really see something that remains with them. So that's a complaint that the locals have course brought in on board of course that comes in with the uh, with the attitude and the mindset that this public uh, this, this this public politics of uganda has come up with the commercialization of politics it is clear cut people want a share because people know that's the time they can eat something and it's it's coupled with uh, the bad economic situations the prices of, the, uh, of items the basic commodities are very high so you'd expect the locals uh, to use this very opportune time at least to get something of the grid so that they can benefit from and of course uh if you go into the other angle of the narratives of uh using money we've learned also that yesterday seven of the of the people who nominated uh, the other three candidates from the other three major political parties that are in the race 
excluding the NRM, that is FDC, ANT, and NUP. Seven of their nominees, people who nominated them, were arrested. First of all, it started as a joke. We saw uh, a one former contestant who was a uh, who is a uh, Odo Damasco, the a gentleman by the name Damasco, who was also implicated sometime back in a, a scandalous uh, mineral issue. Uh, he was the former speaker of, uh, of Moro District. We learned that the gentleman wrote a letter to the Electoral Commission complaining that uh, this, the other people, uh, the seven people, should be uh, brought to, to, the, to the tribunal of the Electoral Commission of reasons that he clearly stated there, which was a formal process. Then later on, we learned of their arrests. So there was this, this seemingly a choreographed plan that uh, we, will, we will write, we will use someone to write a letter. Then later on, we'll pick, pick the people who are being, uh, who, are, who, are, who, are now, who are now being uh, written, uh, who, are, who are being put as uh, people to respond to those allegations that are being put up by the, the said complainant in this case. The said complainant in this case who wrote to the Electoral Commission is Damascus Odongo, who in this case is complaining about the seven people having uh, said that the seven people forged their signatories to nominate this, the other candidates of NUP, who is Akeja, uh, then the candidate of uh, FDC, the candidate of ANT. We learned they were picked and taken to the Electoral Commission office. As far as we are concerned, uh, the Electoral Commission doesn't have the rights to arrest people. The Electoral Commission, also in its mandate, does not have the rights to, in any way, effect arrest. It is only the police that does so. But when we learned that a complaint was filed to them, the best Electoral Commission is supposed to do if in this case they are supposed to act free, fair, and uh, be prejudicial in us, they were supposed to write formal summons to those seven persons and they appear before the tribunal. And in this case, why would you take a tribunal from a uh, by-election being done in Omoro and take it up to Kampala and then make those people appear up to you in Kampala? So it, it doesn't add up. We, then the question goes back to the public court because the media basically... Uh, opens up as the mirror of society. We, we, we definitely tell the stories that we may, it may not sound nice to the ears of very many uh, people in the power that be, but that is what is in the human interest story that we would be telling here. And some of these stories are also being sidelined because certain people may not feel comfort, comfortable enough or bold enough to tell the stories. So that is what is ongoing. We, we are here to understand uh, as to why they've been picked and taken to electoral commission. We're yet to understand why all these scenarios are happening off the grid. But of course, I, I can uh, con authoritatively confirm that we spoke to the person running, uh, the, 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 the person running the, the campaigns for FDC, that's Honorable King PP, who clearly told us three of his people were picked. Three of those people are people who had appended their signatures to confirm the nomination of their candidate. So. We also tried to find out more from him, and this is according to OKNPP. He says, uh, OKNPP is the member of parliament in Chua. He says that these people who are picked from their sources, first of all, they are started by, uh, which is something I'll discuss next, they are started by uh, writing to their candidate. So the people who are picked from the FDC camp were people who are nominated the candidate. Now they are uh, for, for, from, from the PP, OKN, he says, uh, those people are being tried, uh, they're, they're being uh, grilled uh, by the Electoral Commission uh, in, uh, in, 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 uh, in accordance with, uh, with, with what? Uh, they're being grilled by the Electoral Commission. Uh, then they're being told to withdraw their signatures. They're being asked to, to accept a monetary bribe, sort of. They're being uh, requested so they withdraw their signatures and bring allegations that their signatures were forged. So it's, it's a whole glaring situation. That comes in at a, situ at a point when the NRM candidate, Ujok Andrew Olanya, has questions to his paper, where the ANT candidate has also filed a complaint, a formal complaint, suggesting that and arguing that the person that was nominated is not the person who is supposed to be contesting because there are differences in the name. The names are Ujok Andrew Olanya, that is the name that the Electoral Commission has nominated, but the academic documents and the national identification of the gentleman is showing a joke Andrew O. It is not showing a joke Andrew Olanya. So those are two differences that uh, the ANT guy candidate is arguing. And he's arguing that the Electoral Commission must denominate or deregister the NRM candidate, which is a very glaring situation. And of course, he has also said boldly that if his petition is not had uh, prima facie or in time, 
is taking a legal step perhaps to secure a court injunction that will bar the NRM candidate or perhaps put the electoral process to a halt as of now as they sought the candidature of the NRM candidate who according to him and of course according to the law uh, has disparities within the name and then maybe the other thing that uh, we need to understand are the major talking points especially from the ruling party the ruling party so far has assembled uh, to my knowledge over four camps that are running the campaigns of course the first camp is the camp that is being manned by the right honorable Richard Todua who is uh, based in Gulu and of course is manning the secretariat camp then of course the second camp that uh, of course all these camps all, all these major parallel structures that are running the campaigns of this uh, NRM candidate are having financial implications okay they're having financial implications there are uh, there is the cabinet team the cabinet team that has ministers who keep coming in through and using official government vehicles of course to campaign in this question you would ask why can't a minister drive his private car because you're coming for a private party campaign if the nrm uh, in this case is supposed to be brought to book then they should be using a uh, party car party party <coughs> party party property not government or public property in this case so the other third camp that is in play is the camp that is going to be coming through in the more by election in the person of the president president museveni we have learned that was supposed to come here on 20th but there were changes that were made and is coming here on tuesday that is 22nd may and of course that all comes in with financial implications you as uh, people who manage as acfim as an association as an organization that tries to manage uh, or monitor use of money in politics you're very much aware how much money is spent on a presidential packet or presidential uh, convoy. So, and then of course, his presence also will come with a lot of financial implications in the politics of tomorrow. Okay, so that is the other angle that you need to. Of course, then the last camp that is also uh, that is also being uh, talked about much, much preferably in this by-election is the camp of the Speaker of Parliament, that is the Right Honourable Anita Mong. That camp is also a camp that. Uh, uh, we've been we've been told is also splashing in money from the NRM camp in the Moro by election. Then also to cut the border across, you would look into the other major players of this by election. That is the NUP uh, party. NUP as a party now is uh, the largest opposition party. Uh, just yesterday, we learned that uh, in their account they got 1.3 billion from Electoral Commission as part of the money that they are legally mandated to receive from Electoral Commission for their representation in parliament. So NUP is 1.3 billion rich coming into this by-election. And of course, each and every month, they get close to a billion from government in the government coffers for their leadership as the alternative government. So you would think they would come in also with a strong financial muscle, with a strong financial power to battle it out with the NRM. And we've re reliably informed that the new principal, Robert Chagulani, will be coming in tomorrow by election to canvas for votes for his candidate, Honorable Tolid Simon Akeja, who was previously a member of parliament as well. Uh, we've, told, we've been told he's pitching camp, you know, more by elections or for, three, for th close to three days. So uh, as, as, as the NUB made the announcements and they're making, of course, uh, campaigns and structures moving through, we've also learned that yesterday uh, through the police uh, leadership in the northern region, as well, especially from the spokesperson, that uh, the police and the security in Umoro has uh, taken charge and they have set up uh, uh, a lot of patrol points. And uh, uh, notably among them is the major roadblocks. They are putting roadblocks in Umoro. When you go there, you have to identify yourself. You have to tell people Umoro is basically under that kind of security uh, surveillance. Of course, not letting alone uh, the angle of uh, anxiety and uh, threats, intimidation, as many people have reported to the media and, uh, of course, the major talking points uh, of, 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 of security deployment. We are looking at, as the media, the angle of and the possibility of uh, a breakout of political violence or use of violence by the forces or confrontation by the different political divides. I, I want to bring to your attention and the attention of everyone uh, following this show that on the nomination day of the NUP candidate, when he was passing through Lelogi sub-county, Lelogi town center, uh, the NUP team was confronted by the NRN team when they were having their processions. And one of the things that shocked many of us, we saw police basically standing and doing nothing as uh, 
Noop was being confronted by NRM supporters. Uh, that was one of the notable things. So the angle of violence in the by-election, we see it very glaringly coming through very strongly. And uh, this is backed by records of confrontation where you see these two party principles, the NUP party principal, Robert Chagolany, and the uh, NRM party principal, uh, President Muyori Kagota Museveni. We saw that happening in a rural by election, whereby the NRM lost to uh, the then people power uh, leadership. And uh, we saw the violence in, we saw the court cases that came through with the rural 33, there were loss of life, there was destruction of property. And so as the media, we would want uh, a free and fair process, of course, because even in the media, we, we, have a, we have a say that there is no story bigger than your life. We've seen internationally uh, journalists losing their life uh, covering this, 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 this uh, violent situation. So as the media, as people who analyze the deep state, as people who analyze what is happening in society and speak about it, we see a lot of uh, anxiety and build up towards violence. Because but just by the sense that police is already putting roadblocks, you would already put, you already know that the police is actually setting ground for this violence. Because to me and to a person like me who analyzes politics, I think you know, most of this, most of this electoral violence are actually brought in by the security operatives or the security personnel. Because why in this sense would you put in patrol, patrol roadblocks? Okay. Mm -hmm. To me, actually, it plays to the disadvantage of the NRM candidate and uh, a lot may and a lot many other things because the locals have you know northern uganda northern uganda is is is, is, is basically and trying to recover from uganda. over 20 as i conclude as i conclude northern uganda is trying to recover from over 20 years of insurgency two decades of war and uh, there's trauma in the community when they see gun when they see gun they related to violence when they see gun they related to death so it's 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 a politically charged constituency that needs to be taken care of properly uh, by the security. Of course, let alone the deployment, which is necessary, but putting roadblocks, I don't think it is necessary as of now. So that is, that is, that is what I've so far uh, looked into. And uh, of course, I'll, I'll, I'll look forward to sharing more as, as time comes by. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Uh, that's a very, very detailed um, lockdown of what's happening. Uh